Good morning, I'm Pastor Norman, and welcome to Havity Grace United Methodist Church, where we learn and grow as followers of Jesus Christ to serve others and transform lives here, across the street, and around the world. Our sanctuary remains closed for reasons of health and safety, but we welcome you as you join us for worship from around the world. Today, we celebrate Ecumenical Sunday, which reminds us to repent of our divisions within the church, to celebrate the diversity of faith expressions within the Christian tradition, and to strive for shared faith experiences across denominational lines. Our weekly conference call will be today at 745. Uh, dial in using the number that we put up earlier and that we emailed out on Friday in the announcements, and Dan will let us into the call when he sees us. So just be patient, he'll let us in. Some of us have not received our January offering envelopes. I'm sorry for this, but the mail service is having challenges getting the mail delivered. You can still mail your checks to the office. Put your offering envelope number on the mailing envelope or on the check is better and send it on to us or you can put it through the mail slot in the door or you can use online giving. Uh, but the mail service is challenged and, and that, is, that is a uh, that's a fact with which we're having to deal. Thank you for letting us know about this issue, and thank you for your continued faithfulness and generosity in supporting Christ's ministry here. Your support is crucial to our ongoing ministry. I want to take a moment now to thank two of our faithful disciples. For 12 years, Lynn, the wife of Don, and Donna, the wife of Harry, have coordinated our participation as a church in the Grace Place Food Ministry. They are stepping down, and so we're going to be presenting them, and I'll be delivering these later at another time, with certificates of appreciation for their service, 12-year service coordinating our participation in the Grace Place Food Ministry. Well done, good and faithful servants. Thank you for your years of service to our hungry neighbors. Lynn, the wife of Jerry and our librarian, and Jean, the wife of Gary and one of our trustees, have taken on this role. So thank you, uh, Lynn and Jean, for picking up as coordinators. I'm assisted today in leading worship by Angela, a member of our nominations team and a member of our church council. She'll be calling us to worship. Good morning. We meet in different buildings, in different towns. We speak different languages and sing different hymns. We wear different clothing and have different gifts and talents. Yet as we gather together for worship, we become one body, one family in Christ. We join together on one journey, the journey to unite with the risen Christ. We join together with God as the kingdom of God comes and as God's will is done. Let us join with all our brothers and sisters in worship and true communion with God this day. As a sign of the reconciliation Jesus Christ has made between us and God and our desire to be reconciled with others, we announce God's peace. May the peace of the Lord be with us all. Let us pray. Jesus Christ, Lord of the church, we rejoice that you have formed your people into one body comprised of believers of every race and nation. Your salvation has reached to the ends of the earth and to all generations. We praise and thank you that your gospel has reach, reached us and that our voices will join those of many languages this day to proclaim your peace and your praise. Accept our praise, purify our hearts, instruct us in your word, Open our hands and visit us with your spirit that we may follow in the ways of faith. To the glory of God, the creator. Amen. As a praying congregation, as we get ready to go to God in prayer, I'm going to share with you some concerns and joys of which I'm aware. And if you recognize some of the folk that I name, I invite you to call them or send them a card. Do something to let them know that they are in our prayers. I bid your prayers this week for the family and friends of William, 
a neighbor of Dan and Leslie. He has been missing for over a week, and yesterday his body was found in, in their neighborhood, in his neighborhood. So please keep his family and friends in your prayers. I bid your prayers for Lisa, the daughter of United Methodist Pastor Bruce. Lisa is on hospice care following a battle with cancer. Also, I bid your prayers for her ex-husband, Pete, who is hospitalized now after a stroke, and for their 11-year-old daughter. Also, I bid your prayers for Ken, the son of Pastor Bruce. Ken is hospitalized down in Nashville, Tennessee, also with cancer. I bid your prayers for all those who have lost loved ones to COVID-19. I bid your prayers for Rama, the wife of Randy. She's having surgery this Thursday. I bid your prayers for Bruce, my oldest brother. He is recovering from surgery for cancer, but he is home and doing well. Also, I bid your prayers for Sarah, the mother of Judy and Barb, the grandmother of Juliet and Lydia. She's in Lori and Bully Rock for rehab after surgery. Pray for um, speedy healing. I bid your prayers for Billy, the mother of Ron, Kathy, and Mary Ann. Pray for continued healing after a hip replacement. She is doing well, but not yet fully recovered. I bid your prayers for all those who are battling COVID, including Susan June, the sister of Leslie, and Susie's partner, Mark. Sharon, Ned and Linda's niece, Sharon has been hospitalized. And Sharon's husband and three children, also, Amanda, Ned, Linda, and Ned's daughter is recovering from COVID and isolating at home. I bid your prayers as well for uh, Brianne's husband, Steve, who's battling COVID, and for Brianne, who uh, we believe has it. I bid your prayers for all those in quarantine, including Raymond, the grandson of Judy, a resident of St. John's Tower, and for Raymond's girlfriend, Allie, who is battling cancer. I bid your prayers for public health and medical workers, caregivers, and researchers. I bid your prayers for an end to racism, for unity within our nation, and that we become the nation God wants us to be. I bid your prayers for those without shelter in this winter's weather. This week, the Board of Ordained Ministry of our conference is conducting its exam of candidates via Zoom for provisional membership in the conference. So these are folk who feel called to be a pastor or a deacon. It is an anxious time for the candidates, but also for the board, especially as this is a new way for doing this exam. Please pray for them all. As we go to God in prayer this week, Please thank God for those who have successfully recovered from COVID-19, including Angela, Ned's cousin, who's home from the hospital, and her husband, Chris, who is recuperating well from pneumonia at home, and Bridget, the daughter of Nolan, and Bridget's daughter, all of whom are recovering well. Let us thank God for a peaceful inauguration celebration. And let us thank God for medical workers, vaccinators, makers of medical equipment, and essential workers who are keeping things shipped and stocked that we need. Let us praise God that Brandon, Linda, and Ned's grandson is starting a new job. And let us praise God that Maddie, the daughter of Alicia and Brian, celebrated a birthday last Sunday. With our hearts and minds filled with these joys and concerns, let's go to God now in silent prayer as we name before God those concerns and joys which I did not name. O holy God, Lord of wholeness, grant health to your people, both singly and corporately, that we may be renewed to serve you by serving each other. Uphold those who seek to be leaders of your church, that they may be inspired in word and in action. Guide those called to examine them, that they may 
be wise and discerning. Comfort, Lord, all those who grieve this day, who are in the process of dying, that they may feel your closeness and know your love. O holy God, open to us light for our darkness, courage for our fear, hope for our despair. O loving God, open unto us wisdom for our confusion, forgiveness for our sin, love for our hate. O God of peace, open unto us peace for our turmoil, joy for our service and our sorrow, strength for our weakness. O generous God, open our heart to receive all your gifts, gifts found in each other. For through your Son, Jesus Christ, you have reconciled the world to yourself. Help us now be reconciled with each other, that we may dwell in the warmth of your love. O Holy Spirit, inspire us to put aside the cloak of pride and put on Christ that we may forgive and be forgiven. O holy God, thank you. Thank you for recovery from illness, peace after violence, faithful souls who strive to serve you and to help us, new opportunities for learning, growth, and independence, and for celebrations in the journey of life. Thank you for calling us to be your disciples, partners in working good in the world through Christ our Good Shepherd who calls us and teaches us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the time in our worship service when I get to talk a little bit with the children. So I want to say hello today to um, Haley and Macy and Riley and to Molly and Adeline. Charlotte and Lorelai, to Evelyn and Camille, to Ben, Charlie, and Ellie, to Jordana and Jasper, Jesse and Maddie, to Ian and Bodie, to Taylor and Ellie, Emmy and Andrew, Hazel and Iris, Michael and Lillian, to Elena and Eli and Breezy and Ileana, to Amelia and Will and Wyatt and Scout and Max and Zoe. And if I didn't say your name, I greet you too. On your screens you will see a cross. It was a gift to me from a missionary uh, serving the church, serving Jesus over in the Democratic Republic of Congo, what was then called Zaire, over in Africa. And on this cross, you'll see there's a dove and six hands. This cross invites us to use our imaginations Imagination is a gift to us from God, and, and art is a gift to us from God, and art and imagination come together in a wonderful way. And so, using my imagination, I imagine that the dove represents the Holy Spirit, because it says in the Bible that when Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove falls and, and, and flies down from the sky. So maybe the, the dove is like God because the dove is in the center of the cross and God is the center of life. And then there's some hands reaching up and they're reaching up in a way that we see their palms. Their palms up. And I imagine those to be like prayers. People who are seeking things that we need from God or that they are praising God. And then there's a hand that's reaching down from above, and that hand, we only see the back of it. It's like a hand reaching down. And I imagine that hand to be like a hand of blessing that's 
like a hand that's patting us on the head and that perhaps that is God's blessing upon us. But then there are two hands that reach out on the sides of the cross. Whose hands are those? They're like, they're like a hug. Somebody wanting to hug us, to hug people, to hug the world. Are those God's hands? Or maybe they're our hands. Or maybe God wants us to use our hands to be God's hands. God wants us to hug the world and love the world, to love those around us. So this week, when you're looking at your hands, when you're washing your hands, or when you're eating, or when you're drawing, or whatever it is you do with your hands, when you see your hands, I want you to say, thank you, God, for loving us. And then add to that, help me to love others. Remember, to give the world a hug. Thank you, God, for loving us. Help us to love others. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for the gift of hands. And thank you, God, for loving us so very much that you came to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus. Help us to use our hands in ways that are loving. Help us to love others, to show them kindness, to be helpful, to be loving. Through our friend Jesus, amen. So remember this week, when you see your hands, say, thank you, God, for loving me and help me love others. Thank you. Our first scripture lesson is from John chapter 10, verses 14 through 16. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Our second scripture lesson is from Matthew, chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Today we continue our New Year sermon series, Personal Power and Politics, as we explore relationships and unity and leadership. We've been warned that some of these topics may get into areas we find uncomfortable, but Jesus is with us in our discomfort. I think we'll be okay. Our nation is in a troubled and vulnerable position right now. We have a new presidential administration. There's a pandemic raging. And we are, as a body, as a body politic, we are divided and at odds with one another. We are a divided nation. It is my hope that in some way we as people of faith may contribute to healing and reuniting our nation, our body politic, that we may bind up the heart of our nation and help it to move forward in a positive way. We have as a nation dealt with this before. 
after the carnage of the Civil War, we came back together and reunited. We were able to bind up the nation's wounds. We can do so again. We as Christians can celebrate unity in diversity. We can celebrate unity in diversity by focusing on our core values. Focusing on our core values. And we can then offer that practice as a gift to our nation. For if we're faithful in doing that, if we demonstrate that, we are giving a gift to our country. But friends, let's be honest. We are ourselves divided. We are, as a church, divided. We are divided as a church around the world. We're divided as a church around the country. So why do we have different Christian denominations? Some answers to that question are cultural and language differences. We like to worship with people of similar culture and language tradition, okay. History, there are historical reasons for division, although in some sense that's not really answering the question. We are a country of many denominations because we have the religious freedom to do that. If we want to go off and do our own thing, we can leave one religious body and establish another one. But mainly, if we're honest, we have different Christian denominations because of disagreements among ourselves, disagreements of principle and politics and power. And power can be read money. The story I'm about to tell combines elements of economics and religion and history and politics, racism, sexism, culture, and a whole lot else. It is our story. It is the story of the United Methodist Church. And Friday in the announcements, I sent out a partial timeline of this story. In 1784, the Methodist Episcopal Church, typically shortened to just Methodist, was established in Baltimore. And that is not to be confused with the Protestant Episcopal Church, which we typically shorten to Episcopal. So on this corner was Harvard Grace Methodist Episcopal Church. Kitty cornered from us is St. John's Protestant Episcopal Church. One's Methodist, one's Episcopalian. When the Methodist Episcopal Church was founded, it took a stand against American slavery. There were, we have recorded records of white slave owners in this region, in Delaware and in Maryland, who after their conversion, freed their slaves. For reasons of racist mistreatment of African American members in northern churches, the African Methodist Episcopal and African Methodist Episcopal Zion churches broke away from the Methodist Episcopal Church very early on, in the late 1700s and early 1800s. Here in Havity Grace, we also have St. Matthew's African Union Methodist Protestant Church over on Revolution Street, part of a small regional denomination chartered in Wilmington, Delaware. St. Matthew's was used for classes and commencements and celebrations by the Havity Grace Colored School. And just as a side note, their bishop, the Reverend Dr. Delbert Jackson, was my assistant principal when I was in high school. In 1830, as Jacksonian democracy swept the nation, a, a group broke away from the Methodist Episcopal Church over term limits for bishops and voting rights for laity rather than just pastors. Mostly here in Maryland, and it formed what's known as the Methodist Protestant Church. I served a former Methodist Protestant Church in northern Baltimore County, and I knew an old retired Methodist Protestant pastor when I was growing up. 
and I attended Wesley Seminary, which when it started was a Methodist Protestant seminary in Westminster, Maryland. It later moved to Washington, D.C. In time, the Methodist Episcopal Church compromised its position against slavery and accommodated itself rather uneasily to it because there was a fear of losing folk if they didn't. If we compare ourselves to the Society of Friends, the Quakers, they chose not to accommodate themselves to slavery and they became a very much smaller denomination. The Methodist Episcopal Church, however, retained the rule that clergy could not own slaves. Laity could, but clergy could not. The enslavement of African Americans was becoming more and more seen as a moral issue in our nation, praise God, and it kept being raised by delegates to the Methodist Episcopal General Conference in 1836 and 1840, and then Bishop James O. Andrew of Georgia inherited slaves from his first two wives when they died. And his case, tangled up with other issues, was the thing that brought the issue of slavery to the floor of General Conference in 1844. This conference ran from May 1st to June 11th. Now, friends, any of you who have ever attended annual conference know that that is an incredibly long time to be together with a bunch of other people arguing about an issue. And in the end of that, a plan of separation had been drawn up permitting the creation of a new denomination called the Methodist Episcopal South Church. I served at a church in Northern Virginia that was a former Methodist Episcopal South Church and it was named after Bishop Andrew. It was an amicable separation at the start, but then property issues around the publishing house and other assets arose and these dragged on in court cases for at least a decade or more. These were not amicable. Church lawsuits, my friends, are not a good witness for Jesus Christ. Maryland contained churches of both denominations. This congregation was Methodist Episcopal, not Methodist Episcopal South, and it was multiracial at the time of the Civil War. Later on, it became all white until we were blessed to be joined by Ruth and Clarence in 1971. Three famous U.S. Senators watching the Methodist Episcopal Church divide were appalled by the act of separation in 1844. Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, and John C. Calhoun representing both North and South. At least two of them have left us writing saying that if the churches split, the country wouldn't hold together. They were correct. It didn't hold together. Baptists, Presbyterians, and Methodists all divided over slavery. Baptists remain divided today between the Southern and American Baptist conventions. Presbyterians reunited, mostly reunited, in 1983. Methodists, that is Methodist Episcopal, Methodist Episcopal South, and Methodist Protestants, all three reunited in 1939. But in a devil's bargain made to placate the Southern churches, the entire new denomination was a segregated one. This injustice was not remedied until 1968 when we merged with the formerly German-speaking Methodist called Evangelical United Brethren. It was at their insistence that we finally desegregated. Now it is proposed that we divide the United Methodist Church again around the issue of rights for our LGBTQ plus siblings in Christ. This time, property and assets are built into the proposed plan for separation. If we divide, I pray it is amicable. Church lawsuits are not a good witness for Jesus Christ. That decision cannot be made until General Conference, our global body, meets again. And that is on hold due to the pandemic. So friends, this is our story, briefly and in broad strokes. Senators Calhoun and Webster saw that a regional division of the Methodist Church bode ill for the nation. My prayer is that we can work this equation backwards and lead the nation toward greater unity as people of faith so that we can more effectively battle our immediate common enemy, the coronavirus. 
So what does Jesus say in our reading from the Gospel of John today? He says, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. And we have a good shepherd stained glass window here in our sanctuary. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. But I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. Our division of the church is not a great witness for Christ. But here he seems to acknowledge that there are multiple folds, each distinct in its voice, culture, tradition, and ways. Multiple folds that nevertheless can work together as Christ is our leader. If we recognize Christ as our leader, we can work together. Years ago, I remember a Sunday school teacher telling us children that the global church was more like a salad than a stew. She said a stew sort of cooks everything down into one flavor, but a salad is multiple distinct flavors that work together to make a dish. Now, I'm not sure that those who cook would necessarily agree with that metaphor, and it probably doesn't bear too much scrutiny. But nevertheless, it, was, it made sense. Folk can unite when we focus on our core values. That allows us to leave aside lesser issues that divide us. Thinking of core values, I read somewhere, in meeting the moment, we need to love God and love our neighbor. In meeting the present moment, we need to love God and love our neighbor. That is Jesus' great commandment in Matthew. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus reached back as a Jewish man of his day into his knowledge of the Hebrew Scriptures, and he brought out and combined two great gems, one from Deuteronomy and one from Leviticus, to create a simple summary of God's law. Love God and love neighbor. That, that is our core value as Christians. It is something that unites us. The current challenge before us as people of faith in this nation is to live out this commandment, this core value. It is the great commandment for 2021. It is how we will keep each other safe. It is because we love God and love our neighbor that we will work at doing that. It is the great commandment for 2021. It is the great commandment for every year. It is the great commandment for all time. It is the thing to which Christ is calling us today. For if we, church, can demonstrate unity and diversity, cooperation amid disagreement even, then we can lead the nation to unity, the unity needed in the face of the current pandemic. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our theme hymn today was written in 1968 for a stewardship campaign. It is a challenging text as it pierces our tendency towards self-protection and religiosity. It reminds us that worship and prayer go hand in hand with giving and living in the world. So hear now when the church of Jesus, while Miss Debbie plays for us, the tune. When the church of Jesus shuts its outer door, lest the roar of traffic drown the voice of prayer, May our prayers, Lord, make us ten times more aware that the world we banish is our Christian care. If our hearts are lifted where devotion soars high above this hungry, suffering world of ours, lest our hymns should drug us to forget its needs, forge our Christian worship into Christian deeds Lest the gifts we offer, money, talent, time, serve to salve our conscience to our secret shame. Lord, reprove, inspire us by the way you give. Teach us, dying Savior, how true Christians live.
And now as we recommit our lives to Jesus Christ, to be workers for unity and justice, thank you for your continued generosity and faithfulness. And now let us pray in silence as we ponder these questions. What core values can all Christians hold in common? How can we, the church, lead our nation to greater unity? And what do I covet from another faith tradition? That is, what do I admire in other Christian traditions? Let us pray. Almighty God, you have given us your word and asked us to live according to your holy will. As part of your design for wholesome living, we participate in acts of giving. So we dedicate ourselves anew to living in honesty and peace. We give ourselves afresh to love you and our neighbor. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, before us it is blessed. Behind us, it is blessed. Below us, it is blessed. Above us, it is blessed. Around us, it is blessed as we set out with Christ. Our speech is blessed as we set out for God. With beauty before us, with beauty behind us, with beauty below us, with beauty above us, with beauty around us, we set out for a holy place indeed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.